so I'm tiny. Five by three sixty. Yep. Oh, did I did I switch that? Yeah, I did. Up. Oh, sorry, we're live. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's it's it's one of those kinds of days. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and yes, Scott, you are tiny. Um, <laughs> uh, you're you're one of the lesser Scots. It's it's just appropriate. This you know, proves... I kind of, I kind of want to keep it now, <laughs> right? Uh, what, what I'm okay this? with it. That's um, funny. Now, there's an issue with Streamlabs OBS uh, where sh- Skype um, Skype uh, just arbitrarily resizes itself. Um, what did I say? 360? I don't even remember how big we need to be. Uh, it is like 4... No, 480? I don't remember. I have too many windows open, and... Anyway, how are you guys doing? Great, great. I was just hoping that Scott would occupy more space. That'd be great. I'm (laughs) feeling tiny. (laughs) If you've watched Rick and Morty, I'm... The tiny Rick. <laughs> three five by three sixty. Done. Scott, you are now normal sized. Yay! Thank you. Golf so, clap. So yeah. if that's like our only technical difficulty for this episode, that'd be like a really good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Another another repeat of of last week would be preferable to avoid. Yeah. So. Welcome, everyone, from around the world. Hopefully, we got some stuff to show you that you're going to be excited about. Yeah, I hope so, too. So I think we were going to talk more about Docs contributing today. I know you've been hard at work on, um, what do we call that thing? The Docs Authoring Pack. Yeah, the Docs Authoring Pack, yeah. Uh, you got some we, stuff you want to show us? We actually touched upon this the last time, if you tuned in, uh, but... David has been busy at work, so we have even more to chat about. Let me... Uh, is my sh- screen being shared right now? Um, so I just switched over to your... S- well, no. Um, Ed is asking if we've tried turning it off and on again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, they say back now. There you go. Oh, hey, that worked. That worked. So we we do have screen on. We do have audio. That's what they're saying. They can hear us. Woohoo! Now Ed's going to ask questions. Uh oh. <laughs> um, cool. So for those of you that are just joining, thank you for being a part of this. We're super excited. Yes. Ed Ed's asking. So .NET doctors. That's actually the play on words that uh, Cam. Had crafted and yeah, that was the idea. So how do I, how do so, I not catch coronavirus? He says. So it turns out it turns out that naming things is hard. <laughs> as as you can tell by you know twenty years, tw- thirty years of of Microsoft product history. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, cool. So yeah, where to begin? Um, I don't know where the audio cut off, so we'll just. I don't think we ever had audio. I don't know why. I the audio settings did not change this week from last week. The hardware encoding settings changed, but the audio settings did not. So I don't know. Interesting. Um, so cool. So one of the things that we're going to want to talk about is the Docs Authoring Pack experience, and this is a Visual Studio Code extension that's available uh, for content developers, uh, but it's also encouraged for use for external contributors. So one of the ideas is to to encourage uh, external contributors to make changes to docs. And this tool becomes really, really impactful when we start talking about um, like larger feature changes and stuff like that. Like obviously if there's a typo in a doc, um, there's this experience that's pretty straightforward where, uh, let's just go to cognitive services real quick, where you're allowed to simply update um, uh, a doc on the fly via the edit button. So every doc will have this edit button. And then from there, it'll actually take you into GitHub. And, uh, you know, so you can do, you know, minor changes like that. But it's really encouraged to, um, if you're going to be tackling, you know, larger features, to, to use the docs authoring pack. Um, and so it's open source. And the cool thing is there's been some of the content developers who have been contributing to it. Because from our perspective, um, 
we we saw opportunities for improvement with some of the tooling. So uh, I have that running locally, and let's just look at some markdown files here real quick. Uh, and I just want to verify you guys are watching the chat, right? I am watching. Cool. Okay. Uh, so we've got a, an example markdown file here, and imagine that we've got this table um, that's that's existent. And one of the things is in Markdown, there's a bunch of mixed opinions about how to format Markdown tables. Uh, obviously, uh, part of the extension is this preview functionality. So if we're to preview it, you get a live preview. And notice this is actually the dark theme. So it's matching. It's like aware of the theme that I have in my browser. Um, so we're going to close that. But then if we were to select this table, this markdown table, we've added some context menu items. So we can evenly distribute the selected table and get this better unified experience. And what's really cool is um, since it's uh, Visual Studio Code uh, and the extensions are written in TypeScript, um, you know, it, it made JavaScript kind of tolerable. So we could walk up to uh, their extension API and we create a markdown table instance and we, you know, basically space things and calculate like the longest widths of values within the, the columns. And um, so it's kind of cool that we can, we can add features like that to, to our uh, experience. Another cool thing is if we just select the values here, the rows, we can uh, sort them. And some of these menu items are things that come out of the box with uh, Visual Studio Code, but uh, the ones from here up are actually all specific to features that were built in-house by some of the content developers. So we can sort all these uh, items here ascending, which is very impactful as well. Um, and it actually uses a natural language sorting mechanism from JavaScript so that it, it understands that 11 is bigger than 2. Um, if you were just to do like the regular standard sort in JavaScript, actually 11 would be after 1. So there's... Yeah, you know, it's use it's using some of the the best uh, aware technology that you'd expect it to use. So let's do a sort descending. Is there a question? So I let me ask you a question, David. Mm -hmm. You know, this might be a question folks have in their minds. If I wanted to sort on something other than the first column, say mm -hmm. the second column, is that a possibility? And maybe I missed this part. Um, that's a really good question. No, we haven't introduced that. It's pretty generic in that um, sorting looks at it line by line. So it's it's whatever you select here. So if we select multiple lines, uh, you can imagine that these are just a string array and it looks at all the values in the array and it has no notion of like delimiters and line segments or ordinals and you know various, various columns, columns and stuff, and stuff like, like that. that. So, so that's that's certainly uh, an, an enhancement, enhancement that we could uh, look, look to, to add, add. Um, but, but it's, it's not, not something that's there today. today. So uh, those, are, those are some cool things with tables. Uh, another really, really neat feature is there's a lot of people who are familiar with how to make, you know, um, uh, 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 let's see. So, like, we want to call, like, this a uh, code snippet, right? Or, or So we're going to call attention to this is the program class, right? Um, and if we look at that, it renders... That, that little snippet, snippet there as like code, which is kind of neat. neat. So, so that's, that's like an inline uh, segment. segment. But then another, another feature, feature, obviously, and this is all standard markdown, markdown right? So, so you can, can always do, do the triple back tick. But one of the cool things now is we have actually provide statement completion uh, for for the list of things here. So we can do uh, .NET Core, or, or in this case, you know, everyone's favorite would probably be C Sharp since we're talking .NET. So then you can just have anything in here um, that's your, your code, right? Even if it's invalid. Um, I'll just type up stuff here while people look at the glorious statement completion and, and enjoy it. But So let's just go ahead and close all that. But So yeah, the really cool feature is like the statement completion. So one thing that you'll notice is that list is pretty massive. So when you're doing like a code fence, this is the triple back tick. Like these are all of the possible language identifiers that are available for our platform. So the docs.microsoft.com platform. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's been kind of a labor of love, but we're still curating this list and collaborating with the platform team because there's actually some discrepancies just to air out our dirty laundry entirely. 
Um, but having this list is really, really useful because there's been so many times where people who are externally contributing to uh, docs.microsoft.com, uh, they they wouldn't know what to put here. So they'd be like, Can we, do we have to put like C sharp or what's what's that language identifier? Like how do we, you know, is it is it C... Uh, C pound is that valid or you know what is it so uh, so when when you have something that's in there that's actually incorrect this tooling now will also um, light up and say oh, should anyways let me see I'm zoomed in super far so oh that's just a markdown line uh, content do I need to have something there content and code. Anyways, I must be lying. No, there it is. So we recognize that that's an invalid identifier, and we give you that little bubble, and then we let you pick from all of the available, you know, appropriate lists, and then it'll insert the correct alias, which is awesome. So one thing you might be asking yourself is, well, that list is super obnoxious. Like, I don't want to have to manage, like, how do I know... Um, you know, in the context of a doc set, which language identifiers are available. So the complete list is going to be everything that's there. Uh, but you can actually walk up to the settings um, JSON here, and we'll just say markdown uh, all available languages, uh, doc set languages. So this one here is what we want. So we click on that. And what we do is, I mean, we default it to null, but what we can do is it's just an array. So we've got the ability to say that we want .NET, and we want C Sharp Interactive, and we want C Sharp Proper. Um, and the nice thing is we actually get uh, validation warnings here so that if you're to have something that's invalid like you actually get statement completion as part of this experience for editing the settings json itself which is super cool so if you put something that's like foobar something that's incorrect you're like well how do i know what's valid here uh, it'll tell you it'll give you the like hey here's the list so with those things now now that we say c sharp we'll save that uh, we'll go back over here. So now our list should be three items, right? So now we get like a trim down list of things that are possible for us to choose from. And that's just a way for us to kind of scope um, to a, a doc set and kind of share out in this workspace, these are the languages that are available. And I would add something to that as well. Uh, so let's say you see that list of three items that David pulled up there and you have a need to use a language that isn't included in that list, you can certainly still use that language. Uh, that IntelliSense list is intended to display the most commonly used devlangs. <laughs> of course, a bit of humor. Um, we, yeah. we also have a uh, question in the chat. Let's make sure we... Uh, show this at some point. Um, mm -hmm. The question was, are there docs for the docs authoring pack? It's a very meta question. I, I was going to say that. That's the, the, the meta docs. Yeah, are there <laughs> meta docs? So that's a great question and a great segue. Let me pull that up. Uh, as of literally just this morning, the official docs.microsoft.com contribute site has been updated to include uh, I mean, this article for the Docs Authoring Pack has been there, uh, but now we've updated it to include all of the, the recent feature changes. This details, you know, assumptions and how to get to certain things, uh, different keyboard shortcuts and bindings, um, uh, as well as many other things that are kind of pertinent to con consuming this. We've even got a video from this individual on some of the features that are demonstrated. Um, they have an SLA that they call out if you're curious about uh, contributing to the open source project. And then we have a bunch of the uh, features identified here. So if we go through, and I want to be very, very clear, like these features that you see here, like the dev lang completion, the image compression, metadata updates, reformatting markdown tables, smart quote replacements, all like these different sorting things. These are the features that Scott and I um, have collaborated on. 
this is not the sum total of all the features that are available. In fact, there are many, many, many more additional features that just haven't been um, captured yet in terms of docs. So one of the things that we're looking to do is eventually catch up with all of the features that are available and kind of um, discuss them. So uh, the dev lang completion was one that we were just talking about. So this experience now in the, the public can contribute docs will kind of walk you through like the extensions, where they live, um, a summary of how they're intended to work, why they exist, how to manage uh, preferences for them, uh, right? The docs that languages, it talks about those settings, how to get to those, um, how to scope things to your workspace, so on and so forth. Uh, and then they actually get to see it in action with a live demo. So that's kind of the feature set for docs that we've, we've taken time to, to, to put together so that, again, we can start really enabling external contributors to, to use some of the powerful things that uh, we have available to us. Uh, let's also make sure to pop that link in the chat uh, yep. for LQ Dev one <clears throat> Let me do that real quick. Copy, paste, done. Cool. Um, yeah, so we can talk a lot more about different features. Is there is there any things that you, Cam and Scott, want to discuss quickly, or you want to take this conversation a certain way? Uh, something I noticed when you had the docs page open, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, we the individuals on this call helped write those docs, but let's say you find a spelling mistake. It's entirely possible. Um, mm -hmm. How would someone go about fixing that mistake? Let's say this page here has you know, uh, a doubled up word, mm -hmm. the appears twice or something like that. Sure. Uh, how could you fix something like that as a community member? Uh, so would you like just, are you, are you trying to get at like hitting the edit button and going to this experience? Yeah. I'm uh, nudging you towards the edit button there. <laughs> <laughs> Good segue. Uh, yeah, so the edit button exists on all of our docs platforms. So no matter where you are, if you're in, if you're on a docs.microsoft.com site, whether it's Contribute or Azure or .NET or whatever it may be, uh, if you're in a, a, an article like this and you see an edit button, it'll actually take you to the markdown file and the um, open source repository where that uh, file uh, exists. And just to take a step back, uh, so the docs.microsoft.com platform takes markdown files as input and it generates static files, which are obviously the HTML that's served up. So we author things in markdown if that wasn't clear before. So from here, uh, there's a couple different things that you could do. You could fork uh, this repository if you don't already have it forked. Um, uh, or, I mean, even if you do have it um, forked, uh, or, or imagine that you don't, for example, you can literally just click on the edit button here. And so edit, and then this pencil, and then you're into editing that document. And then once you hit, you know, save, it'll actually uh, create a fork for you if that fork doesn't exist and create a patch hyphen one um, branch where on your fork, you have a branch with those changes and then take you through the pull request process. Is there anything you guys would like to add to that? So what, what happens when, when a pull request is created? What's the, what's, what, what's the flow after that point? Let's just do a dummy one, I guess. So edit. So you're editing a file on a project that you don't have right access to. Submitting the change. I uh, will write this, blah, 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 blah. Um, you can put stuff like I like dogs better than cats. Don't. Um, obviously, that's a, a, a valid change. Uh, so, what would happen is you would come down here and you would say, uh, you'd write your explanation of why you're doing that. You'd propose the file change um, and it would create a pull request. So in this document set, I don't think it's automated to the way, uh, you know, to similar to how it is in other doc sets. Like I know under .NET and um, Azure, for example, you get a different experience. And that experience is that you get like a template 
and it just basically auto it automates for the author. It calls in uh, their metadata and it you know adds them so that they they get notified. Uh, so it, it's a slightly different experience than uh, I think this this doc here this doc set. So uh, the workflow that David was just showing is is intended to fix minor problems. Uh, for more complex changes, let's say you want to contribute an entire uh, doc, uh, this actually is not the recommended workflow. Uh, it falls apart very quickly. Uh, in a scenario like that, let's say you do want to contribute an entire doc. You, let's say you add a new feature to the docs authoring pack and want to document that by adding a new page. Uh, the recommendation at that point would actually be to fork this docs repo and to work from your local clone, make the changes there, and then push those up to GitHub. And in a scenario like that, there's actually a docs preview feature in VS Code that you could use to preview what you've built. Um, we could have David show that off, the, the preview icon, if you open a markdown file. Yeah, I'm going to pull up a better a better one to look at here. Let me. This is the Azure repo, and for those of you that are watching, the Azure repo is uh, there's an interesting fact. If you've ever heard of uh, the Octoverse, the Octoverse is actually um, uh, a subdomain of uh, GitHub. But what it does is it it highlights all of the most active um, you know stats, stats from, from different, different GitHub, GitHub repositories, repositories. and. and uh, uh, it allows you uh, to, to kind of get a better idea of certain things. So the Azure repo here that we're looking at um, is massive. It's actually the second largest in terms of uh, con uh, contributors uh, at over 14,000. So that to put that into scale, I mean, the, the second most um, contributors out of any GitHub repository in the world, which is insane. Uh, so yeah, the preview experience is you click on a markdown file and you can preview it and then this kind of shows you how it would render and what that would look like. So you get this this kind of, um, again, there's opportunities for improvement here. Some of the includes syntax, which is a markdown um, uh, extension. Uh, I think it's from either common mark or mark dig, but it sits on top of docfx. Uh, so we have this notion of including things. So that might not render in the preview, but overall you get like, you'll notice that you get like the notes. So alerts, certain things like that do get highlighted correctly. And, and that, that's a nice experience to see. So um, Ed, thank you, Ed, for uh, lighting up our chat. Ed brings up a good point. So uh, let's say you're an existing Microsoft MVP and you're looking for ways to help out in the community. Contributing to docs is a great way to do that. But let's say maybe you're not a Microsoft MVP and that's something that interests you. Um, any real impactful docs changes, say you contribute an entire doc for a new feature, Contributions like that can also qualify you for something like a Microsoft MVP award. Uh, we've seen a couple of folks pull that off. And that's that's ironic that you mentioned that because I remember doing the same thing as part of my MVP um, journey. So I know that Scott and myself were both um, MVPs before becoming blue badges. And Ed, uh, he's an MVP and others and uh, yeah, and contributions like that, anything that you can do to kind of give back to the community, uh, especially if there's e even things as small as um, uh, typos uh, or even features. I remember I worked with Scott Addy before I joined Microsoft uh, as an MVP. There was a bunch of docs that were outdated. I mean, go figure, imagine, right? <laughs> and I updated them to use the latest version of uh, Gulp, I think it was, before that became completely irrelevant as with many other JavaScript languages or packages or modules. Um, but yeah, I think I remember uh, working closely with Scott and that's the other thing too, like the content development team, I kind of speak for myself, but based on all the interactions I've had with my peers, we're super open. We love having that dialogue. We'll work with you. We'll collaborate with you. We're excited to have uh, contributions, any sorts of uh, feedback, positive, negative, whatever it is, we're, we're open to that. Yeah, our, I would add to that that our team for the .NET docs is actually fairly small. And so none of what you see 
as a customer reading our docs is possible without a vibrant community. We really lean on the community to help us uh, tackle the things that we would never get to because of, you know, just not having the resources to do it. Uh, the other thing I would add is, you know, we used the example earlier of fixing a typo. From the surface, you might think, well, big deal. I, you know, I, I fixed a small problem in the dock. That actually ends up being a very big deal in the grand scheme of things because our dock sets are localized to several other languages. Um, you can see how the localization uh, maybe isn't as high quality as it could be if there is a small typo. So I always like to tell people contributions of all sizes uh, really do matter. Definitely. Yeah, and so here's a bit of insider information as well. Um, a lot of people end up using um, uh, Microsoft Word. And this is another feature that we added recently. And I'll just kind of talk up through this feature a bit. So in Microsoft Word, um, there's there's uh, this feature, I think it's called like autocorrect, um, but within there, you get smart quotes. And smart quotes are, if you if you watch very closely what happens here, I'll zoom in, uh, let's undo that. So if I type shift, double quote, it changes, and I'll do a, a control Z here real quick, control Z to undo it. So it takes my double quote and makes it what's called a smart quote or a curly quote. And it's very, very common in typography for that sort of thing. Um, same thing with bullets and uh, single quotes and even things like this, right? So a lot of these things are less than desirable um, and can sometimes even be problematic to have those types of characters uh, in Markdown. So we had a, uh, we added a feature where if you're taking content that was written originally in a Word doc, you copy it and you come over here and you paste it, um, it'll actually automatically replace smart quotes with uh, with the standard quotes. It re replaces, notice this here, we got the, the ampersand um, uh, copy. So this is the valid HTML. It takes the bullets and replaces them with asterisks. So now when you, when you go to preview this, it renders exactly as we saw it um, in our Word doc, but with valid uh, markdown and as we'd expect it to be. So, David, not to make your job harder, mm -hmm. but I just had a product idea. Could you do a <laughs> could, no, seriously? Could we do a word plugin for contributing to docs? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so you just basically uh, take well. Like how, I guess how how would that work? Like, what what's your vision? So, well, I, I guess. I are you suggesting? We, sorry, are you suggesting something like Pandoc that would convert from a Word doc into Markdown format? See, so so something like that, yeah. I mean, because there's there's like Markdown, um, there there's Markdown uh, uh, add-on tools for Word, right? So could we have a like a Markdown add-on tool that that does like all of, does like the whole package, does like the whole, you know, here's maybe like a for form that you fill out for like the the metadata and um, I don't know how, what kind of GitHub integration we could do. It sounds like that's a rabbit hole. We could we could go you know we could go down all day though. Yeah, it's an interesting concept. So I I could see that as simply being uh, you source control uh, a .docx right along the Markdown file, and it's treated identically as a Markdown file. So that would be almost like a docfx change. And for those who are not familiar with some of the internals, docfx is um, the tool that exists that takes our markdown and turns it into static HTML. So I don't know if it would necessarily be like a Visual Studio Code extension thing as much as it would be a, uh, uh, a feature as part of the docfx uh, command line utility. So the the... Here in the uh, in the chat, um, LQ Dev One gave us uh, a link to fastpages.fast.ai, which I've mm -hmm. never I've never seen before. But um, they've got a they've got a uh, yeah that thing there got a, uh, a, a pipeline that apparently converts document different documents to you know to to host on GitHub pages. Interesting. This I wonder if we could borrow. 
I, I wonder if we could borrow some of that tool chain and 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 put it in the uh, put it in the docs. Interesting. Introducing fast pages, notebook, blog post. Example. It mark- might be worth pursuing Cam's idea. We we do have a lot of folks from the product teams that we support who will author blog posts in Word docs, and then you know they all have their different techniques for converting that over to Markdown, but. Uh, this extension idea sounds like it could be really useful for that scenario. Yeah, that's I, cool. Yeah, I don't know what it would look like in terms of source control. Like, you'd, I think you'd have to. There probably need to be some changes to. I don't know, like our publishing system, you know, like DocFX or something, to to like where we currently have a markdown file. It gets you know it gets rendered in the build as HTML and cached somewhere. And I think we would need to do that same step with like a Word doc. Hmm. But so, I, 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 but then we have end up having to maintain Word docs too. So. Yeah, and and uh, why? That's the other thing I'm curious about. So, there's some sort of tool that this is using internally that takes um, uh, a, a DOCX right and converts it to probably Markdown because I think GitHub pages only work on Markdown files. Um, so that's interesting. I'm wondering, does this tool allow for any flexibility, or does uh, the doc absolutely have to be hosted on GitHub Pages? Yeah, it's interesting. Like, if it was like a standalone uh, like service where we could just call into it and get the resulting Markdown. Yeah, something like that. <clears throat> Let's go find out. It's on GitHub. Press so uh, this doc effects tool was mentioned, and I now realize we kind of glossed over that. Um, that's actually a, a completely open source uh, docs build system you could find out on GitHub. Um, I'll actually pop the, well, David's searching for it. You could find it on GitHub under the .NET or D-O-T-N-E-T, and, uh, or you could go to this page that he has pulled up. And you'll see the documentation is is out there. If you wanted to build your own documentation system from the ground up, uh, definitely take a look at using DocFX. And uh, one of our PMs for Docs, uh, Den Delamarski, actually has a blog post on his personal blog that you know explains how you could use something like DocFX to create your own documentation site. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, for all the open source people out there too, or or that you're new to open source, I just I just want to share something. It's a bit of sentiment that I hold close to my heart, and it's something that I think we could do better at as an industry. So when you stumble upon something that you're excited about or uh, it, you're interested in, um, much like social media, when you say like or heart, the same the same is true with starring a repo. So. Give credit where credit is due. Like this is an awesome repo. It's written in .NET. It's open source. You can go jump out there and start contributing to it. You can post issues. You can do pull requests. You can contribute in all these different ways, or you could just consume it entirely free of charge. Right? The choice is yours. But what I encourage you to do is star it. Give it some appreciation. Yeah, totally, totally agreed on that. And you know, for yeah, you know, I've got a couple of small GitHub projects that I manage. Just you know. Things that I've I've created for me that I've shared with, with the community. I don't know how popular they are, or whatever. But those those stars, that they're just a little bit of positive feedback. That you know the 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 little endorphin rush that says, oh, my work here is is recognized. You know, right, right, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is really neat. Um, thank you, uh, LQ Dev One, for sharing this. This is awesome. I'm gonna have to look into this more. Maybe we'll have a a follow up um, as a future episode where we kind of talk about some of the findings from FastPage uh, or even this feature. Maybe maybe that could be an episode in and of itself is where we just all three together start doing like a live share, right? And then mm-hmm. start ha- hacking together on, on pulling this stuff together. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. I wonder if you can do a view only live share. If we could if we could share a live share in a, like a view only format, I wonder what the what the upper limits are for that, for how many people can log on to oh. one of those. That's interesting. Well, we'd have to get a bigger following before it's a concern. <laughs> uh, or, topic or, we or, could... oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Scott. I was just going to say, or we could make all of our technical mistakes early on while we only have a handful of viewers. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, I was going to say another topic we should cover is acquisition of the Docs Authoring Pack extension. Um, I popped a chat in 
or I popped a link in uh, chat earlier to the extension, but it's worth. It's also worth uh, pointing out that if you were to uh, fork our docs repo for any of the .NET docs, and uh, you know, clone that, of course, to your local machine, and then open in VS Code, you would be prompted to install this extension as uh, a recommended extension. Uh, we've actually configured the .NET Docs repos as such, so I think David is, there you go. This extension's JSON file in the .VS Code folder is what's going to trigger that uh, notification that, hey, there's a, a recommended extension for this repo. Would you like to install and, and so that extensions.json file that it lifts there is actually source controlled, right? So as part of that, if if we're to have other extensions in the future that we would like to suggest in the context of this workspace, um, when, you, when you pull that down and open it up, Visual Studio Code is going to recognize that, to Scott's point, and say, hey, uh, we noticed that you don't have um, this extension installed, would you like to install it? And it's a recommendation. So it's, it's kind of nice. I like that feature a lot. Um, the other thing I, that came to mind as we were talking is, um, did you point out in the extensions pane in VS Code all of the extensions that are actually um, installed as part of the pack? Uh, I did not. So, I mean, we show it here in, in the markdown. Let me get rid of this real quick. Um, we show it here in, in the markdown, like the readme for the docs authoring pack, but uh, you'll notice that it actually has many other extensions. So one of the cool things is there's this notion of kind of implicit, uh, like inheritance of dependencies. So uh, all of these are by their own right, individual valid Visual Studio Code extensions. So like Docs Markdown, you could hypothetically just install this extension by itself. But what the Docs Authoring Pack does is it actually aggregates all of these things underneath it. So when you take on the Docs Authoring Pack, you get uh, Markdown Lint, Code Spell Checker, Preview Markdown, Article Templates, YAML, Metadata, Images, so on and so forth. You get all of these things. And those are individually... Uh, searchable here. So like in the left pane, right, I, I went to the extensions marketplace, I type in docs authoring pack. This is obviously like the meta package, if you will, that sits on top of all of those things. Uh, but you can scroll down here and see like docs markdown. And this is actually, you know, it's a standalone thing. You could go get this individually. If, for example, the only thing that you care about is this amazing markdown extension that we've added a bunch of stuff to, you can do that. You could even fork this, for example, and get some of those statement completion for the dev language um, and then update those languages in your fork to be specific to the things that are actually relevant for your build engines, whatever it may be, right? You can also change the version of each of those extensions that's installed. So let's say you install the docs authoring pack, but you want maybe a slightly older version or slightly newer version of one of these extensions, like Docs YAML, for example, you can actually, you know, click the extension and then use the gear icon next to that to select the version of the extension that you want. Do any of these extensions have dependencies on each other? I mean, is that going to create like a like a DLL hell kind of thing? No, that's a good question. So that uh, DLL hell, well, while the the concept is certainly uh, prevalent with node modules and NPM, and I'm sure you've seen that before. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the common thing with JavaScript is it's just copied everywhere. So it's not really dependencies. There's no like cross dependencies on these, these packages. That's a good question though. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, we, I point that out because uh, David and I have done that a couple of times where we'll add a new feature to the docs authoring pack a um, new version is released, and we want to jump forward to that version right away to test it out. That's the technique we would use. Yeah, definitely. So I'm kind of curious, Dave. Maybe you can maybe you can show us some of the behind the scenes. But what is the what is the source for some of this? Some of these extensions look like. Ooh, okay, that's fun. Um, let's see here. So the Docs authoring pack again. It's entirely open source, so anyone could go do this. It doesn't you don't need to be. Uh, like a Microsoft blue badge or anything like that. So uh, let's see. I probably have some fork open. That's. <clears throat> Let me pull this up real quick. So this is the Docs authoring pack. I'm on master. Great. Let's get pull upstream master. Make sure I've got all the latest bits. 
Um, just going to pull down. So let's look at some of the code. Um, interestingly enough, we can probably just look at one of the features that we just recently demonstrated. So that's polling latest. Let me minimize that. All right. So uh, there's there's a fairly decent set of Visual Studio Code extension API docs that exist, and I've been using that pretty much extensively to learn how to interact with Visual Studio Code from the context of uh, an extension. So there's this function that's exported um, that's called activate, and this is how this is actually called uh, when your extension lights up. So for the docs authoring pack, the top level one here, this actually this is just the is this the top level one? Let me see. Yeah, this no, this is just the markdown. So just the markdown one registers all of these commands. So there's things for alerts, includes links and metadata or media, uh, snippets, tables, formatting, like uh, just a ton of uh, different features that are actually available. Uh, so there's uh, other things that you can do. So in this case, we can walk up to like the languages and we can register a completion item provider. And this is actually how we do the triple backtick functionality. Um, and code actions. So this is uh, another markdown code action provider. So what that does is uh, that's where we get the warnings if there's a, um, an identifier that's invalid. Uh, so let's let's focus so, on. So, so so just to understand, that's like you when you hit the triple the triple backtick. Mm -hmm. That that the, the that right there is what wires up the completion item to the. Yeah. So this the, is the actual code for that. Yep. Exactly. Oh, cool. So this is the completion item provider. So it provides completion items given a document at a position with a cancellation token and a context. So we have this document, and this document is actually a text document. And that's this is part of the, now. Now we're into the world of the Visual Studio Code API. Uh, so a text document is anything like this right now. This highlight uh, Lang's TS TypeScript file. This is technically a text document, right? Mm -hmm. So our extension. Uh, we can interact with those documents and so we can get a word range at a position given a regular expression, so the triple backtick. And if that range is truthy, we can get the text of that document. And then that's when we continue on and start matching all and we start doing all of our logic where we, we kind of read through and find where things are that, are, uh, that we want to take action on, right? So that's how we, that's how we go about building out that stuff. So David mentioned earlier that uh, he and I have collaborated on uh, some features in this extension. Uh, my motivation for doing it was simply to understand the VS Code extensibility model. One of the things I found interesting in doing this, as someone who has built extensions in the past for Visual Studio proper, is that VS Code, much like Visual Studio proper, will launch an experimental instance uh, mm -hmm. when you're actually debugging. So maybe you could show off that. So if folks are interested in contributing to this in some way, they understand what that developer experience looks like. Yeah, so that's a really good point. So uh, we were in, I got a lot of repos. We were in the, the docs uh, authoring like top level metadata at once. So what I typically do is I drill down into the individual feature set that I'm working on. So if I'm working on docs markdown, that's where I'll go and I'll open up that folder. Uh, and the reason I do that is because there's some launch uh, JSON files that exist that target just that extension. So it's a lot easier to play with. So here, let me zip up to the top. I'll show you what that looks like. So there's this launch JSON file. There's tests and there's uh, launching of the extension. Uh, so let's go ahead and put a breakpoint over here and I'll show you. Let me see. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Put a breakpoint there. Put a breakpoint here. Okay. And then let's go ahead and hit debug. Uh, one thing I like to do always is just to make sure that I've got a recent TypeScript compile of all the latest bits because I'm constantly developing and changing things and messing around and I never know what the state is of my local JavaScript files. So TSC is the command line utility for TypeScript compile and what that's going to do is just walk up to the source here and compile and make sure everything's good, make sure that there's no, uh, no errors and then we can launch and I think the launch, someone will probably say, hey, why don't you just use like the launch script that does that for you and it's just me being explicit. 
So I'm going to ask a really basic question, and and I I already know the answer to this, but I I feel like it's just something that might might be explained to some folks who who aren't familiar with TypeScript because TypeScript mm-hmm. is one of those things everybody's like oh JavaScript JavaScript JavaScript, mm-hmm. but but like TypeScript less fewer people are are familiar with. Uh, what's the difference between TypeScript and JavaScript? Uh, well, that's really that's a loaded question. So it is <laughs> yes. So but, but like Java- thirty thousand foot view. Yeah, yeah. So JavaScript, um, first and foremost, is amazing. It's one of the most popular programming languages and widely adopted programming languages in the world. Um, so TypeScript is essentially just a uh, a superset of JavaScript. And what that means is any valid JavaScript is also valid TypeScript. Uh, so what it does is it adds uh, types to to JavaScript. So in the context of your IDE, you get uh, a better uh, IntelliSense, better refactoring, better uh, statement completion, better comprehension of what you are intending to do with your code. Uh, and really what that means is you get a better developer experience. Uh, b- because it doesn't, like for me, I've always had this um, uh, analogy that uh, basically TypeScript is JavaScript, but with training wheels, because you have this static type system, and it makes things, it makes you as a developer more uh, productive, I believe, and uh, it adds a, a lot more, um, uh, you know, kind of structure to your intended code. See, I, I, I wouldn't call it training wheels. I, I would, I would emphasize the structure, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the the. The so when you compile TypeScript, is, is does that have to run on a special interpreter or what? What happens there? Uh, so yeah, when you compile TypeScript, there is that TSC um, uh, command line and that comes with Visual Studio Code, by the way. And you can see right here we're using TypeScript three point seven point five, um, and yeah. So what it does is it 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 transpiles your code. Um, and some people don't like that term, transpiles. Oh, it's already lighting up. Um, so we actually have a breakpoint now. Woohoo! Uh, so this is actually TypeScript that we're, be mindful, from the context of Visual Studio Code, we have a breakpoint. So we could do our debugging in here, just like you would with Visual Studio proper. Um, but we have a breakpoint that was hit, and it spins up another instance, which is this extension development host. So this is a full-on uh, version of uh, Visual Studio Code that has our extension version running in it. So when we do things, it it, uh, actually ties back to here. Now what's interesting is it's taking uh, the JavaScript that's executing over in the extension and it's mapping it back over to the TypeScript equivalent. So you get to actually develop and debug in TypeScript, which is awesome. That is is awesome. And then you can just do like, you know, step through it and look at things and, oops, yeah, so let's just grab. And then, so just to add a little bit of clarity here to Mm -hmm. make sure folks are on the same page, it's that experimental instance that launched. Um, That is where you would, you know, open a markdown file and actually test um, things like the docs markdown extension that the authoring pack installs. Uh, David had pulled up a doc that I wrote um, in that example, in that experimental instance. Mm Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, that's where you could test the things like the typing the triple tick and uh, pulling up the list of uh, valid dev langs. Yep, yep, exactly. So it's pretty neat how that, how, how easy it is to get going with that. And I know that um, LQ Dev 1 talks real quick about, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of other nice features as part of TypeScript, like uh, nullable types, pattern matching, discriminated unions, and uh, we do our best to utilize a lot of those features. And I'm I'm a huge proponent of TypeScript itself, but um, actually making a, a valid type system. So it's it's really so, fun to work with. So I have a I have a question that kind of belies my ignorance here. I I don't do a lot of UI, but if if I were doing UI, mm-hmm. is TypeScript an uh, an option to to on the UI side of things? Is is there a way to transpile that into into you know uh, JS like yeah. on the fly or something? Yeah. So TypeScript by itself doesn't do anything. So for example, you can't actually uh, just run TypeScript. It has to compile back to JavaScript. JavaScript is what's known; it's what's used. Um, so, so absolutely. So there's. Go ahead. 
So, so I guess in theory, you'd, if if you weren't using like a development framework that had like TypeScript like built in as like a first class citizen, and when you hit you know, con, you know Control Shift B build, you know goes off and generates JavaScript. I guess there would have to be like in an ASP.NET application, there'd have to be some kind of something somewhere in the tool chain to to get JavaScript out of it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, to your, to your point, like when you do TypeScript compile, for example, um, you end up with an output directory that has all of the uh, let's see here, it's got all of the actual JavaScript. So this is so our extension JS that we were looking at before. This is what the JavaScript equivalent is, mm -hmm. right? So and it, you can so. actually configure the output. Uh, uh, in several ways. I think one example is specifying the ECMAScript version that you want uh, yep. that you want the TypeScript to compile to. Exactly. Yeah, there's there's a ton of really, really neat features with it. Here, I like showing this off. Let me see if I can zoom in a bit real quick. So, since we're just on the TypeScript bandwagon, and I, I don't know, a lot of you guys may not know this, but actually, Ed, who's on the call, he had had me be a guest on one of his uh, podcasts, and we talked extensively about uh, TypeScript, so I, I really enjoy it. So one thing that's really neat is when we look at like the, the, the notion of uh, Anina, let's say day of week, and then we've got, whoops, Monday. Let's make it capital, right? Tuesday, whatever. So what's really, really neat is this is, how, this is the experience you get um, for enums in the context of uh, TypeScript. Uh, and, and it's a simple, straightforward, like you'd expect, right? So Monday equals zero, Tuesday equals that. And you can, you can specify it however you want. You could say this is one, and then it would automatically put that to two. And what's really, really neat, though, is behind the scenes, the actual JavaScript here on the right. So this is the, the TypeScript playground. On the left is the input TypeScript. On the right is the uh, resulting JavaScript. So whoever came up with some of these semantics is a pure genius. So in, in, uh, in uh, JavaScript, you've got this function, and day of the week is the name. So you say var day of the week. It's evaluated immediately. That's what that syntax is there. And it says uh, take the instance of it or coalesce over to uh, the assignment of a new empty object. Um, but then it's, it walks up to it and says via the indexer, this is um, specific to you know JavaScript, you have like indexer properties. So you can say uh, the verbatim string Monday is equal to the assignment of one. One, one passes through and then is also an index assignment to uh, uh, of Monday the string literal. So it's like a reverse map. And that's what right. enums are. So it's crazy that whoever came up with this was like, yeah, this is how you do that in JavaScript. But to think, if if you weren't a JavaScript developer, like expert, right? If you didn't have like all this knowledge, coming up with this type of functionality would be super difficult. And it's not something that's standard out of the box. Instead, use TypeScript, work with enums, right? And then it's, it's that's all you have to do is just worry about that stuff. Very very C sharp like. So yeah, I, I, I know TypeScript is again. I don't do a lot of I don't do a lot of you know JavaScript in general UI or anything. But TypeScript has always looked very attractive to me as a C sharp developer. I've always kind of felt like, well, if I ever need to start getting into UI, there there's there's a way that I can feel more comfortable right away in 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 working in that exactly. environment. Exactly. Yeah, I just stopped sharing my screen so everyone knows. I think we're over time, but this has been great. Uh, one closing thought. Uh, so the playground that David was just showing is a fantastic way, at least in my experience, to get up to speed on TypeScript. If you are interested in contributing to that docs authoring pack, and let's say TypeScript is the barrier to entry for you, check out that playground to you know figure out what the syntax is for whatever it is that you want to do. Awesome. I got to drop off, guys. I got another call I got to go to, but thanks for having me. It's been great. Thanks All right. Everyone. Well, thank you, everybody, and this is uh, this the end of this episode. We'll see you again next week. Uh, we're going to have something new to talk about next week instead of the docs uh, contributing, uh, the, the docs authoring pack and contributing to docs and so forth. Uh, thank you for...